The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. The words from Jesus in today's gospel lesson are ones that we often hear at occasions like funerals. I think people like this lesson for funerals because of the assurances that are embedded within. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I am the way and the truth and the life. And of course, the really popular one, in my father's house there are many dwelling places. I will go to prepare a place for you. These assurances are not just for funerals, though. Jesus speaks them to his disciples as part of what is known as the farewell discourse in John's gospel. Today's reading from chapter 14 actually kicks off this farewell discourse section of the gospel, which is three chapters long. It's all about Jesus preparing his disciples for his coming death. He's speaking truthfully, patiently, and lovingly to them about what is to come. And then today we hear these words not in the context of a funeral, but in the context of the Easter season. In our church year, we are no longer journeying with Jesus to the cross. Jesus has overcome both the cross and the grave. We are in Easter. We are working our way to Pentecost, where we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So why should we care about God's house and a Jesus who goes to prepare a place for us in this Easter season of life, not death? Well, we'll get there, but first we're going to talk about this house, God's house. And I've had this song stuck in my head all week as I've been preparing for this sermon. Um, And so maybe you've heard it before. It's kind of a popular, like, evangelical kids song. Um, I heard it growing up, going with my friends to church and stuff, Um, and bear with me, and if it gets stuck in your head, I apologize in advance, but it goes a little something like this. Come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. It's a big, big table with lots and lots of food. It's a big, big yard where we can play football and then yell, touchdown. It's a big, big house. It's my father's house. This song and many of our imaginings about this reading point us to this heavenly imagination of a mansion waiting for us far off somewhere with lots of rooms, a giant table, a lush green yard, probably some grand entrance like you see here on this slide. Some translations even say that in my father's house there are many mansions instead of many dwelling places. 
as if one mansion is not enough, but you need many mansions within the one giant house. This is a pie-in-the-sky vision of Jesus going ahead to make ready for us a heavenly abode that puts all of our earthly fantasies to shame. No wonder people like this reading at funerals. It sounds pretty nice, pretty spectacular. Sounds like something to look forward to one day. And maybe this is what the disciples envisioned too. Or maybe they were just as confused as us when Jesus says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Just before this farewell discourse, Jesus tells his disciples the tough news that he must die and that one of them will betray him. And now he's saying, but you know what to do. You know the way. And just then, Thomas quickly jumps in and assures him they indeed do not. Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Concerned and confused, Thomas speaks out. How can we know, God? How can we be certain what you are talking about or how to get there or what comes next for us if you're going to leave us? Maybe Thomas's response resonates with you as it does with me. There's so much wisdom in Scripture and yet sometimes I wish there were more, more of a road map, more of an explanation, more certainty around what it means to follow Jesus, more clarity about where we are going in all of this and what comes next. And then Philip has something to say out of his anxiety and uncertainty too. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. This is more of a demand than a question coming from Philip. But both of these disciples, they just want to know what to do. They just want to know what all of this means. They want satisfaction and comfort in their next steps. They want to know that they are believing and acting and following in the right way. Of course, Jesus cannot make things simple for them. He doesn't hand them a road map or a GPS device. He doesn't say X marks the spot. Or it's the house over there with the blue shutters. He doesn't show a wallet-sized picture of God to Philip. Instead, he points to himself. He points to himself, the one right in front of them the whole time, and the one who must leave them soon. Jesus gives us another one of the seven I am statements from John's Gospel, which you see on the banners on the wall here. In our gospel lesson today, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. When Thomas says, how can we know the way? Jesus assures him that he knows the way already because he knows Jesus. But Jesus goes further than to just say he is the way. He is also the truth and the life. Jesus is all that is true and good. There's no falsehood or deception in him. He is the life, the way to living, the way to abundance, the way to salvation. Death does not stand a chance with him. And to Philip's demand to show him the Father, again, Jesus points to himself. Have I been with you all this time, and you still do not know me? I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. To see and know one of us, is to see and know us both. We are interconnected. You have seen God by seeing me, Philip. These answers to the disciples' questions and concerns, they don't exactly give them the road map that they are looking for, but they do point them to the way. They point them to Jesus, to the one who has walked beside them all along to the example of how to live and how to be in the world. But just like we often focus on how big God's house might be and what coordinates it might be located at, sometimes we focus more on the second half of Jesus' I am statement than on the first. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Too often, this is people's biggest takeaway from this passage. There's a misplaced focus on the exclusionary translation of this phrase, 
rather than the overarching love and compassion portrayed in Jesus' words to his disciples. Too often this passage is used to condemn our siblings of other faiths instead of being held up as a message of hope for us. These words to Jesus' disciples are overwhelmingly words of comfort and assurance in a time of confusion and hurt. Jesus is focused on the particularity of the situation in this moment, not on excluding folks from God's love. After all, in this same gospel, in John's gospel, when, he, when Jesus says, I am the gate, and when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he points out that he has many sheep from a different fold. There's room for all in God's love. Even if we take different paths or routes, even if we come from different folds. Ultimately, Jesus is speaking words of comfort and hope. And to focus on anything else in this passage is to miss the point. He's giving his disciples a pep talk after he's just told them the devastating news of what is to come in Jerusalem. He's assuring them that he is with them, and even when he's not, he will prepare a place for them. He's assuring them that they have all the information that they need and that he is the way. He's assuring them that he believes in them. He believes in their ability to carry on and do even greater works than these. He's assuring them that they will not be alone. They will not be orphaned. As part of this assurance, Jesus starts this three-chapter farewell discourse with the words, do not let your hearts be troubled. That's how the NRSV, the version that we read, translates it after all. But in her commentary on this text, Angela Parker, she reminds us that a more accurate translation is let not your, plural, y'all, let not y'all's heart, singular, be troubled. This shift is so important. Think about that. Do not let your hearts be troubled to do not let y'all's heart be troubled. It shifts from the individual to the communal. It shifts from my heart and your heart to our heart, our collective heart. This shift shows that this comfort and assurance, this message from Jesus is about community, not just individuals. Jesus wants to leave his followers, the community, the ones who will carry out his legacy of love and welcome, with a sense of confidence and peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. I am going to prepare a place for you. In God's house there are many dwelling places. There's room for all. The Greek word for house here is oikos, and it's not like the yogurt brands, although that's where that name comes from. But this word is more than just a physical structure. It doesn't just represent a building or a place, but it represents the relationships that happen within that building or place. In its Greek context, it's more of a household. In in its Greek context, it includes all who live under one roof, all who interact with that house, whether it's the, the, the head of the household to the children, to the workers, to the enslaved people. In God's house, there are many dwelling places, many places of mutuality and relationship. It's also no mistake that the, the, word, the root eco for words like ecosystem comes from this Greek word, oikos. This passage and John's gospel are all about relationship, like an ecosystem connected about connections and mutuality and dwelling within and together, about how God and Jesus are so intertwined and we are part of the entanglement. Jesus tries to spell this out for us and for his disciples. God is in Jesus and Jesus is in God and God is in us. We are all interconnected. Jesus may be leaving his disciples behind, but they know the way because they know him. He's like a tablet that you drop into a cup of water. He may not be visible anymore, but his essence is pervasive. It's there. 
fully present in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. His example lives on. In Genesis, we hear about this dwelling, too, that God dwells with us in our breath. In Galatians, we hear that it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. In Acts, Paul preaches that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. And in John's Gospel, in another I am statement, we hear that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. The connections go on and on and on. The ecosystem of belief is deep and wide. God dwells in us. We are tethered and entangled with God. We may not have a road map or a photo album or know the exact right way, but we do know the way because we know Jesus. We have Jesus as an example of how to live, and we have the Holy Spirit as our guide. It's so much more about the journey than it is about the destination. It's so much more about having hope than it is about having it all together and all figured out and all right, whatever right is. It's so much more about connectedness and relationship than who gets to go where when they die. It's so much more about hope than fear of what comes next. So what does the household of God really look like? this Easter season? Is it a big house with lots of rooms and a big table with lots of food and a big yard where we can play football? I don't know. And I don't need to know the address or the paint color or the square footage because I know that it belongs to God. I know that God's house has room for all. I know that God's house is flooded with the Holy Spirit. I know that God's house is about relationship and connection and mutuality. I know that God's house is a place of hope. I know that God's house is built on a foundation of love. I know that God's house has a big, giant welcome mat at the door. I know Jesus, the way, has gone ahead of us, preparing the way and showing us how to be Easter people as we journey this day. Amen.